Justine Malone with TMC Media sitting here today with Ladipol. He is currently touring Australia all the way from Nigeria. Thank you so much for the time that you're giving us to tell your story yeah. and um, inspire all the new and young artists coming up. Thank you. It's so good to be here for real. Like um, I tell people this is the furthest from home I've ever been in my entire life. So of course, I'm never going to forget this experience. And it's, it's exciting, but it's also humbling. It's humbling because like, they tell you your music is going places. I mean, but like when you are at the other side of the world, then you really, you really start to believe it, you know? So, I mean, I'm happy to be here right now. Yeah. Did you sure. think that you, it would, um, you know, you only started your, your first album really dropped in 2019. Did you feel in such a short amount of time you'd be traveling the world with your music? I mean, you know, the thing about it is that I've been, I've been work. <sighs> I decided I wanted to be an artist, let's say in 2014, 2015. That's when I started to say, this is what I want to do. And I've been, you know, I've gone from an independent artist, somebody who used to write their own press releases, somebody who used to figure out how you're gonna get your songs on radio, um, signing on to record label in 2017, putting out a project in 2018. And to get to this point, it's amazing because you can see something in your head, but to now start to live and breathe it, I, I tell my team all the time that like, yo, we're in Australia. Yeah. Like we're all the way here. So I, I feel like I feel like it's such a big moment of realization. Sometimes you have to stop and realize it's happening. Damn. Yeah. So I want to go a little bit further back to your upbringing and where you're from and what really framed you into the person you are today and what drew you into music. So tell me a bit about your childhood, where you were born, your family dynamic. I uh, I was born in. Lagos, Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos is the most popular city in Nigeria. Uh, it's the commercial capital of Nigeria. It's where everything happens, you know? And um, I grew up there in a place called Ikeja. And um, I had a good childhood. My parents did a really fantastic job of shielding us from the hardships of the country. Because Nigeria is a very hostile environment. It's a tough place to, to be, to, to make a living, to establish yourself. Yeah. You know, at the same time, it's the, it's the one place in the world that you can go from nothing to something quickly, but also another place where you see such big divisions of wealth. Yes. Massive, very stark. Yeah. So like to grow up there was interesting. It was memorable, you know, and, um, but my parents also kind of, they, they wanted us to experience life in different ways and they encouraged our creativity. My, my dad especially encouraged, encouraged my creativity. I always say I'm from a family of civil servants, you know, because my, my dad's dad was, he was, a, he was a judge. My mom's dad was was in the army. Yeah. And then both my grandmothers were, were nurses. So they were in the spirit of giving to others, you know, that was into the community. That was their, that was their role. And none of us, nobody was into music. Nobody was making music, you know, we're just listening to music. So to be the sole person that is doing this now is incredible to me. And I think it's still like dawning on my parents that this is happening because I went to school for something completely different, you know, but growing up in Nigeria is like, you can only see it to believe it. Nigeria is alive there's so many people everybody's going about their way doing their thing and it's said you nigerians are very enterprising because you have to go out and get it yourself and i feel like all of that kind of seeped into who i've become i was not somebody that made music growing up it was when i got into university i went to university in america yep. you know my parents really sacrificed to send me to school in the states for university and that's when i started to realize that hey i had a i had a a gift for words, I had a gift for putting words together and making music. And that's when I started to really explore it. In fact, I was the one out of my brother and my cousins, when they would write little raps, I was the only one that went to other people's music and took their raps and put it in mine because I didn't write, you know? Yeah. So to be the one that's now making music is so, is so different for me. So, I mean, like, I think that when I now moved back from America to Nigeria is when I went from understanding I had a gift to telling stories because I think at home is where the real stories are. Yeah. Life in Nigeria is, is so, is so incredible how it's different for different people. Just so being able to tap into that and tell that, tell little bits of stories, I think it's probably been the most powerful thing of my career. And then, so going from Nigeria, um, you're from Nigeria to the US, what were some cultural shocks you faced? That's, that's a good question. Um, I see it, but you know, the thing about it is that some of it is kind of not new to us. A lot of stuff is new because, you know, watching movies all the time, yeah. 
So I remember, I remember I was watching, man. Like I thought Nigerian University, I mean, American University is going to be very wild because I see like some like universities where, I mean, m movies where crazy stuff is happening, you know, and I expected my, my university to be like that, the wild stuff happening, but no, it was a bit tame. Um, culture shock, what would that be? I think just the language, the slang, you know, how I'd say, you know, for my, I would say, what is it? They say fries. We say mm. chips. So yeah. I'm like, I want some chips and they'll give me like potato okay, chips. chips. <laughs> exactly. No, but it's like fries that I'm asking for. <laughs> so stuff like that, I had to get used to very quickly. Um, at that point in time, it wasn't cool to be African. It wasn't cool to be Nigerian. That's a big thing. You know what I mean? And it was huge stereotypes, you know? So you were either like the African who doesn't know anything about anything and, and maybe you, 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 live in Nigeria, you must live next to animals or you're a prince. Do you know what I'm saying? They, yeah. they see you as, because now movies like Coming to America and stuff like that had been popular yeah. in their culture. So that you're the African prince with huge wealth. So it was like just two lenses that they looked at you from. So I was one of the first people to co-found this African student organization on my campus because it was like, we have to let people know who we really are, yeah. you know, and show what our culture is, is about. So I think that um, America showed me where, how we were viewed. And it's so incredible to see through music, through uh, our culture and our arts, the view of Africans is different. We're like the coolest now on the, con you know, yeah. in, in, in the world now, Afrobeats has brought a new lens. Now, if, movies like Black Panther have resonating in different ways. So I feel like, you know, at that time I saw the, the transition and to be also in my own small way, part of that is, is quite amazing, you know. So tell me about the organization you put together and what was the reason, like, what did you do with that? Um, it was cool. Uh, myself and, oh man, I've forgotten her name. She was the president. I was the vice president. I was the first ever vice president. And we just, you know, little, do, did little events to, to kind of bring, Africans together on campus, yeah. also to introduce our culture to others. So we'll, you know, things like cooking and, you know, having people come over and try different foods and stuff like that. And um, it was also cool, you know, because it changed my experience in school. Um, I was just the outsider before, but then after a while I became like the, the guy. Yeah. You know, because it's like, okay, you a new African student moves to the, the school, they, they got to know me, you know, at some point in time. So I think that it changed my entire, like, experience in America, I felt like I had community yeah. and family. And that really stuck with me. Like community is like the heart of music now. I realized that, especially now my music is starting to touch different places, but I can't afford to forget the fan base that first started listening to my music, that my original community, because they are the reason that I had the confidence to even do what I do. Yeah. And I think that all these little things that happened to me in university gave me a particular like perspective that I've kept up with yeah. you know yeah so. so you started really playing around with music in University yeah. of America and when you got back to Nigeria was that a bit of a cultural shock again how did you feel going back home after being away for so long it was many things because when I started uh, music in, in Yankee oh sorry that's slang so <laughs> in America we call it America Yankee like in Nigeria that's, that's how we refer to it Yankee yeah. so when I was in Yankee I started making music with two guys one was my producer his name is Kurt and my friend Jeff so that's when I I got introduced to making music through them and we formed a group called Lyrically Equipped. It was hilarious, the what name. Lyrically Equipped. Oh, we, thought we, we, thought, we thought we were so cool, you know, because we kind of focused more on like lyricism and like yeah. saying something. And so um, we dropped two projects. One was called um, Rhyme and Reason. The second was called Hip Hop Anonymous. So we were, we were doing our little thing on campus, you yeah. know, people kind of knew us. And then, but it was a small, tiny thing that we were doing. So to come back to Nigeria, where at the time the music scene was blowing up and getting bigger and yeah. bigger. And I met some guys out there called Show Them Camp. They were a group that were also establishing themselves. And one of the guys that I met, our parents introduced us. And um, they, he heard my music and thought it was dope. And this is the first time I'm getting that outside. This is a stranger who doesn't know me listening to my music, telling me my music is cool. That's That was pretty that was a mind shift to me. I wasn't expecting that. To be able to be on par with some people out there who are consistently, that's what they did. Yeah. So that, that was a mind opening. And also at the same time, I'm no longer rapping in a group, I'm by myself. So that was a whole different shift. Like, can I really do this at this level solo? You know, and um, 
through my interaction with them, I met more artists and more artists. I started to record more songs. I was still working a job nine to five at the same job? time. I worked in um, I worked in a hospital, like in their quality assurance department. Because yeah. I when, when I started, I went to study in school for like biology and chemistry. I want to be a doctor. Yeah. So you have to understand the shock for my mom. <laughs> Particularly my mom. I mean, yeah, because somebody who went to school, like medicine is on his, his brain and he comes back saying he's kind of interested in music. It's Nigerian parents don't really go for those kind of things. No, trust me. Was it, it was, yeah. you're talking about culture shock for me. That's culture shock for her, you know? <laughs> so like, I think that that was a big, a big shift for my family to see how I was gravitating more and more into music. It wasn't my siblings supportive. My parents were like were watching with one eyebrow raised, mm -hmm. you know, but. Did they support it? They support me. So it's like, I, we want you to do the thing in life that makes you happy. However, this thing that you're moving towards, the main fear of parents is that watching their children struggle in life and doing something that they felt that you might struggle in and wouldn't provide for you, it makes them scared. And I felt that fear. But at the same time, I felt them not wanting to dampen this thing that was I was so confident yeah, and growing in confidence. Exactly. So it was kind of, both of those things, but they will always remind me, go, you got to get, you got to make money. You got to establish yourself. You have to provide, you know, so to them, to see things, how they've gone now to the, to me being able to do things on my own, me being able to provide for myself, buy whatever I need, if it's a car, if it's a, my own place, whatever the case is to them, it's, they can't talk. Yeah. All they can do is now applaud, yeah. you know, and, and, and they don't, they don't, they are willing to tell me that they're proud of me. You know, so I think that that transition is probably one of the biggest things you can feel as a, as a, as an artist and, and as a human being, it's the love of your family, the support of your family. Yeah. So do they come to your shows a lot? Uh, that's a good question. You know, they actually haven't been to any one of my big shows. Also because I'm very particular, I'm waiting for the right one where they can sit in the front row, have an experience. I don't want them standing in the audience. Uh, my first ever show I did in 2018, I called it Ladipo Live after I dropped my first project. My mom was there the day of the setting up. So just to see the stage, how it was going to be, the lights, she was like, wow. Yeah. You know, she didn't come for the actual show because it was an all standing show, but it was, uh, her first real glimpse that, hey, mm -hmm. people know my... So now it's different for them because they get like WhatsApp messages, oh, I saw your son on TV. So it's it's now, they can't avoid it. It's yeah. now a fixture in their lives. And also I've been to probably to more countries than they've been to combined, maybe. You know, uh, so it's becoming like a thing. The family yeah. is starting to realize this is, this is what's happening, you know, so they're accepting it. So I'm going to go back to what you've mentioned at... Um University of America, you mm. said that you did a couple of songs. Yeah. What were they about? Oh, man. Like, what were you singing or rapping about back then? I remember one of the songs on Hip Hop Anonymous, which was second project, called International Lovers. So we're talking about, like, love in different places that we, we travel to or, you know, and things like that. We had another one called Hip Hop School, where we're teaching, like, where we're talking to, like, kids on what it's like to, like, make music. Uh, we have another one called, what else? Um, the topics are really diverse. Yeah. I mean, and also we're in school, so you're experiencing so many different things. So it, I find now like in the music space that I'm in, especially in the Nigerian music space, a lot of it is about love and romantic stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's very one dimensional. And I think that as somebody who's a rap artist, you have the privilege of being able to touch on different topics in depth, you know, as opposed to just keeping it all one topic. And I feel like it's something that I have to maintain in my music. And what are the topics you like to uh, sing about or rap about? So I have a, so one of my, one of my um, definitely there's a romantic song that kind of put me on the map in 2020, a song called Know You. And it definitely is about romance. Yeah. It's a cute song. <laughs> with a cute about bit, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You the, know, uh, the you know, are great. you know, and then, um, but the song that came after that, that really was a, a huge breakthrough song was a song called Feeling. Yeah. And feeling that idea of I like the way I'm feeling now is not necessarily talking about anything more than it's, I, I like it because I feel like it's subjective. Mm -hmm. Whatever you like, whatever is making you feel good is what you're thinking about when you hear that song. And I think the ability to make music that cuts across genres, demographics, and hits home and where a person can personalize the song, I think that's like the ultimate songwriting. 
personally, you know. But right now, the topics are varied. I talk a lot about my country. I talk about a lot of how it feels, but I, I don't talk about it like nail on head. Like I have a song called Running. And the idea of the song is that I'm just running on vibes. I don't know how I'm, I got from point A to B, but I'm still moving. And I feel like it's an ode and a nod to my country, but not in a way of saying, lamenting about the specific issues is about the feeling and finding a some kind of metaphor a way to carry the idea forward and i think that that's the best form of writing when it's like not necessarily on the nose yeah. you use innuendos and other ways to kind of communicate what you want yeah, yeah. i found that with the no you song mm -hmm. it was a it was a bit of a, a bit of a metaphor but it was in between relationships yes, can you exactly. explain um, a little bit give us some background about that one where those uh, lyrics came from so I did that song with an, an artist called Simi uh, she's an amazing artist an amazing writer and I've been wanting to work with her for some time yeah, and, voice. and uh, yeah she's got an amazing voice and I remember hitting up because I, I sent her this Instagram um, DM where I think I hit her up in like 2016 or 2014 or something I'm like look I would love to do a song with you I was like we're strangers I would like to change that we've never done a song together I'd like to change that too and you know she was like okay us being strangers we can change that she's like you doing a song with me that's not up to me but i hope that it happens and a couple of years down the line it happened so i went to simi's place to her studio and i was in the studio with her you know and she was we're trying to you know get to know each other and what she was asking me a bunch of questions yeah i don't really like being asked a bunch of personal questions <laughs> so i remember telling her that look any other person i would tell them i don't really know you well enough to answer those questions i would tell you directly mm -hmm. And then I was like, yo, that'd be a dope idea for a song. You know, the idea of, I don't really know you that well, but I feel something for you. Yeah. And that's how we got on the topic. And, and we, we wrote, we literally wrote that into the lyrics. Yeah. You know, I don't really know you that well, but I like you. Yeah. But I feel something very strong for you. And despite us being strangers, this is a significant moment for me, mm -hmm. you know? And um, it turned out into, be, into being an amazing song. We released, we wrote that song in 2017, but dropped yeah. it in 2020, like in yeah. the middle of the pandemic. And it was such a great moment to, to, to drop a song like that because people still craved physical interaction, but were, were separated. Yeah. And I think that song really resonated with them. Yeah. And it's so funny, I was going to drop another song, but that didn't work out. And we now pivoted to this song. Yeah. And it is the one that really kind of like broke open the door yeah. for me, you know? I feel like it's the kind of song that if somebody listens to it, it doesn't matter where they are, they can, they relate to it in a different area in their relationship. You can almost have multiple understandings of it, mm. which some, you know, song mm. that's, as you said, when you hit it right on the head, it's like, there's your answer. But yes. it was one of those songs where you kind of think I about it and you go, what do they mean? Like, what was their relationship? But yeah. it's nice to hear about it. I think finding your answer is the best I, look, when you meet somebody and they say, oh, I heard your music and it made me feel like this. Or I was going through this and this brought this new insight to me. That's the biggest compliment, you know, you can receive. And I think anybody's new project or new album as an artist, you just wanted to shed new insights about yourself and your life and your experiences. Yeah. So angling the conversation a bit more to relationships, mm -hmm. what is your, um, like we, we won't dive deep into your own personal life, but more into as an artist, how do you see like love? You know, you write about it a lot. You think about it a lot as, as when writing. What is your view on it? So interesting because I feel like it's probably the most over overused word, not overused, used word most it's it's such a it's it's a powerful emotion that has been attached to so many things to just like drive our desire for things and I think that love is quite possibly the most powerful thing on the, in, on the planet and it's interesting how we've used it in such like a commercial way you know I I find it so interesting but at the heart of it I find it to be important I find it to be we are we don't function well without it. I feel like people slowly break down and fall apart when there's a lack of it in their life and you're constantly seeking it. That shows just how much, how I, I cannot imagine doing what I do without that, without feeling the support from my family, without feeling the support from my partner. I think that it will not, it's like eating food that is tasteless. You're getting the nourishment, most likely the carbs, the proteins and all that kind of stuff, but you're not enjoying it. And I think that that is, it's, it's necessary yeah. in life. And um, I'm not interested in a life without it, you know, quite simply. 
So in relationships as an artist, how do you manage that? Being on the road, being in the studio, um, your visions for the future, knowing that it takes a lot of time away from your personal life? You know, the biggest balancing act is because the music, the career, especially because it's something that you're, I'm passionate about, it directly competes with your relationship. It is a relationship in itself and it demands everything. Every aspect of you is, you need it. The same stuff you put into a romantic relationship with somebody or a platonic relationship with somebody is going into the music as well. So I feel like relationships are, they can be you, tough, um, but it's so possible to have something that is beautiful as well. You know, if you have a partner that believes in you very strongly and um, has their own passions and convictions and you guys can coexist, I think that it's probably one of the hardest balancing acts ever for me is being able to maintain a healthy relationship as well as do this full throttle. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I won't lie to you. I, I feel like that's one of the diff most difficult things for me as an artist is maintaining that balance. Yeah. yeah. And do you think you're clearly a star on the rise? Like you, you've only, you've spent a few years locked down and COVID would have stinted that. Mm. But how do you think that your relationships are going to change as you get busier? You know, I read Missy Elliott tweeted something recently. She's like, you know, you can't take everybody with you, you know? And I thought that that was interesting. Because yeah, you realize that you no, know, not everybody can come on the journey, you know. But at the same time, there are people that are vital. Like I need grounding influences around me. I'm that kind of person that enjoys family. Yeah. You know, I need to feel like I'm connected to them. Um, and I'm, you know, you miss so many birthdays, you miss you miss so many events, you miss so many anniversaries, you forget some of your anniversaries. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you know, but I mean, like it's it's just that I I need to have a sense of family around me. That's the, my ultimate grounding influence. You know, like whenever I travel, when I, whenever I land in the country, I stop by my parents' house, always. You know, I go and see my mom, you know, who's usually the one at home. And, um, cause I, th those things I needed in my life. Um, but I also realized that you can't take everybody with you. You want the smartest people in the room around you. Like I make this music However, I realize it's a brand that I'm creating and this is only one aspect of it. So what else are we going to do with it? Where else are we going to take it? So I need smart people around me because this to me is not a game. You know, I want to establish myself and leave a legacy and leave an impact behind. So um, I realize that you, you need the right people in the room with you. I like how you said you need smart people around you because it is a business uh, as an artist growing. You are selling a brand, mm -hmm. you're a product in a way. So how do you know who to trust? I mean, they might be smart, but there is this level of relationships They're on the road with you a lot. Who do you know to trust? The gut feeling is important. Your instinct is important, you know, and some people are particularly maybe like conniving and can suppress that their other side and you only reveal it to you later and hey you're going to get burned sometimes in the business i've learned that myself um i'm very observant i am slow to bring people into my inner circle but once you're there you do have a lot of my trust so it is it is dicey i won't lie to you man because you meet so many people yeah. and everybody's talking a different game so to figure out who is the guy it's not easy you know i feel like i'm slowly um building my own team, I call it the diamond formation, you know, where you have, you have your, you know, your guy in front, you got people at the side and the person behind you, you're right there in the center because at the end of the day, you're the vision provider, you're the one that says, this is the vision, this is how we go get it. But um, it's not easy to know who to trust. You have to trust your gut feelings and, um, like and go with that. Here. Yes, it's that's the diamond formation. Trust me, it's yeah. the best way to attack the whole game because I swear this is, is, is it's war, it's strategy, it's so many things that go into this as well as you have to also let reality and authenticity flow. Not everything can be too calculated, you know, do as you feel. But at the same time, some moves have to be orchestrated for the maximum like mm -hmm. impact to be yeah. felt. Yeah. There's always somebody out there to yeah. Know. You, exactly yeah. you can't mm, you can't snooze you know and i'm trying to especially because of the, the industry i'm part of you know that I'm, I'm coming from where they say that rap music is not like the main sound and it's not it, it can't make money it can't sell i am every day i breathe every day i drop music i'm rewriting that narrative you know so i'm aware that i have to be 
I have to be at top level all the time, you know? Uh, I don't see myself, I, I use the term rap artist because they like to pigeonhole rappers where I'm from. They feel like it needs to sound like how it used to sound maybe in America in 2010. And I think that, look, I'm African, we're Nigerian. Our music, our rap sound is gonna be very different. It's gonna be more melodic because we love melodies in, in Africa and in Nigeria. So I'm, I'm aware that I am presenting things. I'm changing up the, the, the game over yeah. there for sure. One thing about your sound that we love is that you've got this rap concept mm -hmm. and then the melody, which mm -hmm. very much taps into Afro beats. Mm -hmm. we, there's the Afro beats, reggae, mm -hmm. hip hop, mm -hmm. rap. It's yes. they're all in the same sort of genre, mm -hmm. but very much separated mm -hmm. and, you know, not yeah. loving each other. Yeah. But you're almost trying to bring it together with your sound. Do you, would you ever look at collaborating um, in, in that scene or do you like, uh, the sound that you're creating by yourself with, with the artists that you're mm -hmm. working with currently? I think that first and foremost, what you mentioned, I even think Afrobeats as itself is so many genres mm -hmm. placed into it with a very strong African um, driving force, yeah. you know, and so like, and as well as rap music, which traditionally of course kicked off in the US, has a lot of things going into it, a lot of soul, a lot of R&B, a lot of blues, a lot of all those things. And so when you bring all those sensibilities together, it's definitely going to be another rich, like just diverse pool, yeah. you know, sound waves. And I believe for me, I need to make something that really stands out to me. Yeah. I love anthemic stuff. I love soulful stuff. I love all these different things. So it's, it's imperative that I make a sound that is unique to me. And I will do that by myself. I will do that with collaborations as well. I feel like it's important to be effective in both realms. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I understand the impact of being the only one in a song, but I also see the beauty of finding somebody else who sees the same vision as you and, mm -hmm. and you guys connect on a track. So collaborations have been very important to me. In fact, a lot of my biggest songs are collaborations, you know? So like, it's something I'm excited about and I, I only want to collaborate with people that I meet, I link up with, that feel good energies with. You know, I, I, link, I saw what's his name, I met this guy here, Manu, Cro Manu, Manu Crooks. What's his name? Manu Crooks. Yeah. He's Australian and um, he's based out here in Australia and I definitely feel like his energy is dope. So it's somebody I might link up with on the track. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. You should um, record something in Australia yeah, with sure. him. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That'd be good. I wish I had more time. I'm leaving on Tuesday. Yeah. But this is a place that I, I definitely think I, I like Sydney. I look, they, don't get me wrong, but I'm in Melbourne now. But your weather is very interesting. Yo, but Sydney's you, weather. You've hit up Melbourne in a yeah. really interesting yeah, weather yeah. time as well. It's chilly right now in Melbourne, you know, but in Sydney was yeah. really, the weather is lovely in Sydney. Yeah. So. It's usually really nice in Melbourne at this time of year. So we're, we shouldn't be all in our jeans. Uh, yeah. So speaking of collabs, your label has some great artists in it and you are all or have recorded a uh, song. Can yeah. you tell me about that one? Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm on Maven. Yeah, I'm signed to Maven Records, which turned 10 years this year. And uh, we dropped, we're dropping an album called Chapter X, Chapter 10. And um, that's coming out December 2nd. Yeah. Coming out December 2nd. And so we released a single from it earlier on this year called Overdose. And that just went crazy and we just dropped a second single called One Damo. One Damo means they know. Yeah. Just read rough it's like they know. In other that's words, like the, the, yeah. Your, we walk into the room and you know, you know, yeah. they know, you I know. Like and um, so that's that just came out and that's already like topping the Apple music charts in Nigeria. It's like was the most Shazam song in Nigeria as well. So it's it's, it's starting to blow up. Yeah. yeah, so that's crazy. And yeah, I've got I've, we've we've got what how many artists on the label now? Yeah, who's on lot. it? Who's on um, it? Who, who, who was in the song that you on that song? Oh, so all of us are on on one damn more. That's my that's Rema Crayon. Who else is on it? Um, Boy Spice, who was recently signed. Bayani, who was recently signed. Ira Star is on it. Uh, Johnny Drill is on it. I'm on it. Who am I? Am I missing anybody? I feel like I've hit. Magix is on it as well. You know, so all the entire label is just there displaying. Wow. You know, exactly. So it's it's big. It's a big record for us, and it's a big moment for Afrobeats because labels labels of that size are not many yeah. with that many artists on the label. So to be able to release music on this level and the music is starting to like go beyond the shores of our country it's amazing you know like yeah. it's amazing how far the music has come like i can't even lie to you man like 
I mean, where you know, Rama has a song "Calm Down," which is just doing numbers. "Calm Down" is going crazy. He has a remix with Selena Gomez. Yeah. You know, Ira has got um, "Bloody Samaritan," which has got a remix with um, what's her name, Kelly Rowland, right? I think she has a remix with Kelly Rowland on it. Who would you like to do a, re- a remix with? Ah, uh, man, I have a song called "Big Energy." I would love to put. Um, I wanted to put Black Sharif, who's blowing up in, in Ghana as well, on it. But, you know, ultimately, man, I want to get that song with Drake. I want to get that song with Kendrick Lamar. These are, like, artists that I really admire. Also, because someone like Kendrick is such an outlier for the music that is popular in America. He's making his own sound, but he's so on top of it. So he's mm-hmm. such an inspiration for me. And then Drake is somebody that's always understood lyrics and melody, you know. So I feel like he's somebody to look up to as well. So the big guys for sure, but also the guys that are coming up as well always excite me too, you know. So I feel like the music is opening up to conversations we never thought we'd be having, mm-hmm. but we're having them now, you know. So were those influences that you always admired mm-hmm. or have they uh, become bigger influences now that you're in the scene? When I started rapping, the guys I really looked up to, looked up to were like rappers in the American space because that's why I started rapping mm-hmm. in America. So um, there's, this, there's this group called Little Brother. They're based in this, the town where I, when I went to school, North Carolina. A guy called Fonte, he was just incredible with wordplay. You know, the idea of using double entendres, which is one word that means many things, but yeah. placing out lyrics, like it struck me. Drake was a big influence, Travis Scott, because Travis Scott just knew how to like break down his, his use his vocal sound to give you a feeling, you know? Yeah. Um, so many like, was many rap artists, you know? And then moving back to Nigeria, people like M.I., um, M.I. is a huge rapper in Nigeria, STC, um, NATO C, these are big Nigerian acts, showed me that you can break open the industry. Mm-hmm. You can find your place in the industry. Um, and it made me believe that, because I came in with a whole lot of confidence. I was like, I can do it as good or better than everybody that I see. I've never, if there's one thing I have, you know, it's, it's confidence, you know. And so I feel like even right now that um, when it comes to like the, the rap artist space, like I'm one of the go-to guys, you know, it's just me and a few other people that are, are the shining lights. But I, I recognize that it's not competing with them. It's about competing with the other Afro because the biggest artists on, on our country are the Afrobeats artists. I want to be competing with them. I don't want to just be seen through one lens, you know, and I feel like there's so much to achieve and I'm ready for it. My team is ready for it. Well, I mean, Nigeria, there are so many millions of people there and I feel like Nigerians are almost like bo- Africans are like born with this bass in their voice they there are so many great artists and singers with the platforms making it so much more accessible for them to launch their own music do you ever get a bit nervous that there's too much noise out there like how do you want to stay above it all and break through that's interesting that's a good question yeah I mean like Nigeria is becoming like the the mecca for for Afrobeats there's other countries that are huge in this space as well our neighbors ghana you know and when it comes to african music not just afro beats south africa your country you know and my piano is huge you know um the east is also producing some really amazing talents but nigeria definitely has is showing itself to be the hub at the moment and um there is a lot of artists coming out there's a lot of competition um there's a lot of labels now establishing themselves there and i think what I think about it really at the end of the day is I hope for my old colleagues to make really smart business choices, mm-hmm. um, to link up with the right platforms, realize you don't always, I'm assigned to a label, but you don't always need to go that route. You can break it down. I really hope that I'm happy to see the noise and I'm happy to see the competition because I think that's why we're pushing so far ahead. Yeah. But at the same time, I really want us to sign the best deals. I would hate to see 30, 40 years from now this artist that was this has nothing now because somebody came and exploited them. That's the only, the only fear I have is exploitation. I think at a time like this, where there's so many diamonds that are polished and are in the rough, the tendency is for somebody to come in and take advantage of the yeah. situation. That's the only concern that I, I maybe have. So you have to be really careful. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Sign the right deals, you know, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And any artists that you've been working with that are unknown that you would like um, to kind of do a shout out to? Yeah, shout out to Oladipo. Um, my name is Ladipo. My, my actual name is Oladipo. His name is Oladipo. I have very, very similar names. Yeah. But shout out to him because we just dropped a song yesterday or two days ago. 
The song is called E No Fit Be Me. E No Fit Be Me means just literally it's pigeon English for it can't be me. You know what I mean? Um, so it, we just dropped that song together uh, recently. It's a really good song. He's somebody that I feel has a big uh, future ahead of him. And um, he may not be the most known, but I feel like he will be. So big shout out to him. Um, uh, shout out to everybody I've collaborated with. Shout out to Buju uh, or Benson. Because by name, he's the one I'm feeling. You know, he he's he's really done what he's done even since that song. Before that song, but since that song has just been meteoric. Um, I'm just grateful to be at the time where I can, my own music and collaborating with me can also like shine light, you know, yeah. and, and, I, and I think I'm going to be careful with that to, to know that, that that power is there and we should we should keep like amplifying sounds and amplifying artists and amplifying moments, you know, so I'm grateful for that. So is that your goal as a musician is to really shine light on the world? Like what is your vision for what you want to bring into the world with your music? I wouldn't even lie to you. First of all, my first goal is definitely a very self-centered one. I want to go as far as I can go. I want to push my music to, to the max. I want to, ex I want to grow my brand as big as I can. And I want to achieve all the, all the daydreams I've had in school. I want, I want to act them out. Some of them already happening, you know, yeah. um, it's the little things, you know, in Nigeria, like where, we're very, we're very aspirational because a lot of times you don't have, you're coming from a place of not having, you know, so be able to do things like purchase things with the money you made for the thing you love. As simple as that, whether it's a new microphone yeah. or a car, it is a powerful milestone. That's why you hear people talk about it in their music because it means so much to them. Yeah. And we're not operating on credit. I didn't go on a credit plan to do this. I'm paying, boom. Yeah. How much is it? 50,000? So, you know, so the, the, the fact you're able to do something like that is monumental. Mm -hmm. So I definitely want that the vision for myself is that part of it, though, is the legacy. I say leader of the revival. So a leader has to be leading people. And I think that I want I came through the music through brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Like when I moved to Nigeria, some guys put me on. They, they invited me to the studio. They, they, they put me on tracks. I want to be able to do the same thing. I want to be able to shine light on the next big, big star, the next big artist and say, yo, I believe in you now when nobody sees you because I can see the talents. And I know that people are telling you that this can't work, but it can. Yeah. I absolutely believe that that is a fundamental role of any artist, any leading artist. When you become an artist, you don't realize how many hats you wear. Mm -hmm. You first wear the creator, creator hat, then you might be an activist, then you might be somebody who's educating people. Like it really is, it really changes. Yeah. And I want to have a brand that is flexible enough to embrace all those hats. Yeah. And you say that you pay for things. So when in your career were you starting to make money? Oh man, so nobody asked that in interviews. I'll tell you that, nah, you know, making money for me really happened, started happening in like, a little bit in 2019. Mm. I signed to, to a record label in 2017. And the first couple of years was us understanding each other because the label at the time was really known for like Afro beats acts, Afro pop stars, you know, singers and stuff yeah. like that. So I was the first rapper that signed. And for my fan base, it was a almost 50-50 division. Oh my God, we're so happy for you, Paul. Finally, you get the, the look you deserve. This is a big platform, Don Jazzy. Don Jazzy is the our president of the label and he's a massive, influence in the Nigerian yeah. scene. He just turned 40 the other day, so everybody's wishing happy birthday. Happy birthday, Jazzy. <laughs> um, so to sign to that, the other half of my fan base was like, oh no, they're gonna make, well, they're gonna destroy his sound. They're gonna change his sound up. It's over now. So to those two years on the label really, like I, sh I saw the work ethic I had to maintain because I saw art acts that were bigger than me working hard in the studio. I was like, I knew I need to match that. Yeah. Then also I knew, I understood that I need my own authentic sound to still shine through. You know, so my dropping my first project, which is still a rap based project, it kind of brought my fan base, rallied them around me. It's like, oh, wow, yeah. he's still, he's still him. He's still yeah, he's still there. So like, I'd say like, it took like two years on the label okay. to start to see like, like income. Yeah. You know, it was a hustle. It was grafting all the skill sets, all the mindset that I attained as being an independent artist, doing it on your own. You need it on a label. Nobody's coming to hold your hand. You need to say your vision. So it took a couple of years. Then like 2020, that's lockdown. You know, um, 
know you dropped and then things just started to slowly shift i first got my i remember when i got one uh this brand deal that we just we did a little activation together it was um um it was a hot chocolate drink cadbury it was a cadbury thing we did i remember when i got paid i remember calling the um one of the guys at the, one of the top executives at the label tech i'm like yo is this the money you can make from this she was like that's what I'm talking about. When, he, yeah. when, I, when I saw that, I was like, hell yes, I'm about this life. Like, I could do this, you know? And so to me, like, yo, I can't explain to you. I mean, I've, I've made money working my job, working my nine to five. And yeah. after what, what I was working, I became like a healthcare consultant because it, it gave me the flexibilities to go to the studio. Yeah. You know, you, you earn money. It's different earning something from something you love, yeah. something you're passionate about, something in the middle of the night, they wake you up and you're happy to do it. Yeah. To earn from that, I don't. Th I think it's in top five greatest feelings ever. What's yeah. your top? What's your top feeling? Greatest oh, no, feeling now. Now, now we're gonna go into this. There's some things I can't say on camera. Oh. That's for sure. <laughs> I definitely can't say some of those things on camera. There's like, so many questions now. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, trust me. But like, it's one of the top five feelings of of being able to provide, being able to earn f from something you love. So you are completely 100% an artist now. Yes, 100% an artist. Like, the money I make is from the music I make. And when did you resign and resi resi transition? Um, 2017, because that's when I signed my record deal. And I told my, I told uh, uh, the consulting firm I was working with, I told her, honestly, like, this is what I'm doing. This is yeah. the new journey I'm embark embarking on. And I, and I need to focus on it. And they were scared, worried for me, too, because it was two, two ladies. They almost, like, saw themselves as, like, my moms. Yeah. They were like, we wish you all the best of luck. We think that it's a huge gamble and a huge risk, but go ahead, you know? And now they're the ones calling me when they do like different conferences and platforms, they call me to speak. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, being able to establish, it also makes you proud. Yeah. You're making other people proud as yeah. well. Yeah, so. Well, you're here now, you're in Melbourne, your first big international yeah, yeah. trip, and it's only a couple of years out since mm -hmm. your record deal. Yeah. We are going to see you rise. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, is there anything else that you would like to kind of finish off or add to the interview? I want to say thank you to everybody who's ever supported me and people out here in Australia and Australia. That's how you guys Australia. say Australia. <laughs> in Australia that have really, you know, championed the sound, that have pushed my sound. Like, I can't do it without you. You understand that, right? This is just impossible. So I remember there's somebody that I met. She liked one of my songs called Jaye. Jaye means enjoy life. I dropped that in 2019. And she had said, one day you'll be in, in Australia because she was based in Sydney. And I remember when I now announced it's coming to Australia, she DM'd me again. I said, I feel like I manifested this. You know, so to have those kind of people who love your music really supporting you and yeah. still being around it's 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 crazy so i want to thank everybody who's done that make sure you hit me up on the social platforms hit me up let's talk how can we because one of the things i'm big on is how can we create opportunities to meet like meet and greets like moments tell me what it is because i'm here because you know you stuck by me and i appreciate yeah. you guys so much okay. yeah well thank you so much i've appreciated this really good in-depth long uh discussion Likewise so so good so valuable yeah. and um yeah enjoy the show tonight we are yeah, you are just yeah. about to go on stage mm -hmm. and have a great time yeah thank you so much so yeah again here with laddie pold with tmc media and i'm justine malone yo what's up guys it's laddie pole and i'm talking to tmc media australia's largest independent music video platform but you knew that shout out to afro chain for bringing me all the way it's laddie pole we're going to shut it down tonight